Greetings, and thank you for being with us today. I'm Larry Wessels, co-host for Pilgrim Publications Presents. And I want to uh, introduce this show by mentioning the fact that we are currently in the middle of a series on the doctrine of the Trinity, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To expound on this, and like I said, this is show number two in a series we're doing on this, I want to introduce my uh, co-host for this program, Bob L. Ross, director of Pilgrim Publications Presents. If you'll see him on the screen here, you'll see that Bob uh, has written several books on uh, various topics, including uh, the fact that he is one of the leading publishers in the world of the works and writings of C.H. Spurgeon. Bob, would you like to say anything? Well, since you mentioned Spurgeon, Larry, um, on the front page of all of Spurgeon's sermon volumes, which are 63 volumes, he gives a uh, statement there affirming his committal to the doctrine of the Trinity as taught in the Bible. And, uh, of course, many of his sermons do expound on the what we call the doctrine of the Trinity in one way or another. But uh, we are uh, actually devoting this time to the doctrine of the Trinity to focus upon the person of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our Redeemer. He came into the world, took a human body, lived under the law, went to the cross, suffered, bled, and died, was buried, raised again the third day, and now is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, ever living to make intercession for us. And, uh, from whence we look for his soon return. So we're not zeroing in on a theology or a uh, uh, controversial subject so much as we are wanting to magnify the person of the Lord Jesus Christ by focusing upon him, that he is God in the flesh, the Christ of God, and... Uh, I think the uh, Trinity, as we said in an earlier program, kind of weeds out the cults from the true evangelical Christians. I, I don't know that this would be an absolute standard by which to, you might say, uh, try a group. But certainly, if a group is not committed to the doctrine of the Trinity, at least that Christ is God in the flesh, although they may not have what we might call an orthodox statement of the Trinity in their theoretical statements, they must be committed to that confession that the eunuch made to Philip that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's God in the flesh, that he's deity. And John, when he wrote his epistles, he placed a curse upon those who would deny that God has come in the flesh. And uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not judging people merely on the theoretical statements of theology books or the creeds or the confessions or the statements of faith. Uh, not that there's just an absolute structural wording of it that you have to adhere to. But certainly I believe that down deep in one's heart, he must imbib this doctrine that Peter imbibed when Jesus said, Whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he committed himself to Christ as God in the flesh. Well, uh, now you go ahead and get us stirred in the right direction here for this <laughs> well, I'd discussion. like to also introduce Bob. Uh, uh, you know, thank you for that, Bob. But uh, we'd like to introduce also for our viewers our special guest again uh, for this series on the Trinity. Mark McNeil. Mark McNeil is a valedictorian of the Texas Bible College from 1990. And uh, last time we had this program, Mark, you did a very, uh, I think, uh, stirring and enlightening uh, exposition on the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, maybe you could refresh the minds of our viewers who had seen it last time and also for the sake of those that are just, just tuning in right now, uh, what is the doctrine of the Trinity and why is it important? 
Well, I'd like to first say that I'm happy to be here, and I'm glad to be able to discuss the truths of God's Word. I'm glad that our hearts have been stirred by God to love and appreciate what He's revealed to us in the Scriptures. And uh, as we grow in the knowledge of those things in my own life, I've just learned to uh, love and cherish the Scriptures more and more and approach God, uh, hopefully with a more humble heart and attitude wanting to learn of Him. And uh, But the doctrine of the Trinity is something that uh, virtually, or I guess we could say, everything about the Christian faith flows from the doctrine of the Trinity in one respect or another. Uh, all of the attributes of God are essentially locked up in a correct understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. The, uh, the power of God, the uh, fatherhood of God, the sonship of Christ, His sufferings for us, His, uh, his uh, humiliation and coming and taking part of flesh and blood, His atoning death, and, uh, and then, of course, salvation being wrought by the Spirit of God in our hearts. So I think the doctrine of the Trinity is, is really central to our faith as Christians, and everything we believe flows out from this and uh, gives us a correct understanding of it. But the doctrine of the Trinity is uh, simply the doctrine that there is one God who has revealed himself as being the Father, being the Son, and being the Holy Spirit, and uh, that these are real distinctions within the being of God, personal distinctions, but yet they are the one true God, that there is the Father who is personal and acts upon us and moves upon us, and there is the Son who is personal and real, and there is the Holy Spirit who is personal and real, and that they interrelate, but yet they are, they are distinguishable but not separated from one another so that they are the one true and living God, uh, both plural and united inseparably forever. And uh, so that's just simply the doctrine. And I think some doctrines, if I can just say this, some doctrines, uh, I know this is a point that cults attack or groups attack about the doctrine of Trinity, but some things I think it is wisest to simply receive them and to love them. And uh, I think as Spurgeon said, as he was commenting on Psalm number 2, I remember him saying something to the effect, some things we ought not to pry too deeply into that we ought to reverent, they are to be reverently received and loved and, uh, and not to be attacked. And so my position, I guess, over the last few years has developed to be I'm not so much interested in arguing how things are about God, but that they are. And with regard to the doctrine of the Trinity, I think we've got abundant evidence in the Word of God that it is, that it is true, that it is real. But when we start trying to delve too deeply into the mysteries of God's nature, that's when we get in trouble. And that's what groups attack, is how can this be true about God, not necessarily what is. And I think we're talking about what is true about God, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we love that and appreciate that. And that's just basically... Uh, Larry Mark used a word there that uh, suggested a scripture to me and is in conjunction with this thought of uh, mystery. In the book of Ephesians, uh, the scripture says... For this cause, this is chapter 5, verse 31, by the way. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And then Paul uses the word mystery. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, Paul told you what he was talking about, and yet he called it a mystery. And I believe that what he means by that is that it's not something that is deduced by logic or that appeals to our reason so that it is so apparent to us, to us that uh, it's not mystery. It's, it's not something that is uh, uh, awesome as a rational concept. Now, he says here, a husband and a wife shall be one flesh. Now, it just doesn't say one. A lot of times this is quoted by various ones, and they just say, shall be one. No, it says one flesh. And yet here are two people, two individuals, and yet Paul says they're one flesh. He says, this is a great mystery. Now, as we have talked about the Trinity, last time we had the program, and then this time, uh, it keeps occurring to me that 
I'm conceiving of someone sitting out there in the television audience watching this, and they are saying, like some have said before, it's not logical, it's just not reasonable. How can you have three and have one? How can these things be? And uh, they're letting the logic of their mind, the reason of their mind, the rational elements of their mind, if you want to call it that, run away from divine revelation. What we must realize in biblical uh, things or the biblical world is that we're either going to have to accept revelation or we're going to have to junk our committal to the Bible because this Bible claims to be revelation. And there are certain things that uh, we're going to believe and we're going to have faith in and we're going to act upon simply because they're revealed in this Bible, not because we thought them out as rational, logical, reasonable conclusions. And uh, this doctrine of the Trinity or the revelation of God's person is one of them. And just like this husband and wife being one flesh, uh, it's a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ in the church, Paul says. And so uh, we've got these things that we're not going to rationalize or come out with logic and demonstrate the proof of. You know, I debated Mr. Brown some time ago, and uh, one of the points in that debate was about the use of reason and logic. And uh, I think I made a good point with him on this, and I'll kind of repeat it here to the uh, TV audience today, that uh, uh, what we call logic and what we call reason is our way of thinking. In Isaiah chapter 55, the Lord said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, but as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. And uh, so when we come in and we say logic, reason, rationality, uh, really, if you want to get right down to it, the rational, logical thing to do, reasonable thing to do, is to submit to revelation. Because uh, if there is a God in heaven and if he has revealed himself to us in the Bible, what could be more rational or more reasonable than to junk our way of thinking and accept revelation? So... The Trinity and the revelation that we are contending for on that point, it is divine revelation. And uh, when a man comes with logic and uh, rationality and uh, whatever he wants to call it, he's really coming with something that is, Isaiah 55 described it to be far below what God reveals in His Word. Well, it's, it's just kind of an absurdity, as a matter of fact, based on what you're saying, in that a finite man is trying to figure out to the nth degree an infinite God. When a finite man thinks he can figure out this infinite God by using logic and reason and stuff, it, it's absurd to begin with. You just can't figure out an infinite Creator to the nth degree using your little finite mind. It just doesn't work, and it backs up, you know, I think that links in perfectly what you're saying there, Bob. Well, uh, that'll get, us, get our audience back to uh, what we are talking about uh, from the last program, tie it in, just lead on through the show. Uh, the last time we were on, we were talking mainly about church creeds, the creeds of Christendom relating to the doctrine of the Trinity, how some people you know, they don't like creeds, uh, no creed but Christ, and all this kind of thing. And Bob was giving a rather, uh, I think, excellent exposition on uh, the meaning of creeds and, and things of this nature and the historical aspects of uh, how the church over time has uh, built up, you know, creeds and teachings as they believe the Bible to, to relate to man in the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, Bob, I'd like you to kind of pick up there again. And, uh, of course, I'll have some charts here. I'll link in what you're saying down the line here. But just to refresh our viewers' memory a little bit from a previous show, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, creeds and, and their importance. Well, Larry, 
I would assume that most of the people that will be watching this program have been subjected to some form of uh, institutional Christianity. By that I mean some church. They have been to a church, a denomination, and uh, that denomination in history has a statement of its doctrine in some form. And usually this is in the form of what is called a confession of faith, a statement of faith, or a creed, or uh, an expression, a doctrinal expression. Sometimes an individual church will have its own statement of faith for that particular church. But broadly, denominations will have confessions that have been set forth from time to time by that particular uh, denominational group of people. And I know in the Baptist uh, fellowship, of which I'm a part, we have had through the years three or four outstanding confessions of faith. And it's not that one is set up as to oppose another, but every generation, it seems, may need a fresh statement of a doctrine that might zero in at one point on a certain uh, element that needs emphasis or that needs a special defense, so to speak, of the Baptist understanding of it. So we've had the uh, first London Confession of 1644, the second London Confession of 1689, and then in America it was called the Philadelphia Confession of 1742, and then we've had the New Hampshire Confession of uh, 1833, and then there have been several less significant confessions of faith that have come forth since then by various uh, Baptist groups that uh, maybe have not had the notoriety. But there's a book I have here. I brought it just to illustrate my point uh, on this. This is a book called uh, Baptist Confessions of Faith. And it has all the uh, various Baptist confessions that have been set forth down through the years. It's written by W.L. Lumpkin. There have been two or three books like this that give a, uh, just quote the whole statement of faith of these groups, these Baptist groups that have set them forth. Now, uh, this is true of all denominations, uh, all religious entities. They state their faith in some form. Now, they may not call it like Baptists do, confession of faith, but you can go into, for instance, some of our Church of Christ friends who say we don't have creeds, we don't have this, we don't have that, but you can go into their churches and walk in the foyer of the church and you'll see a gospel paper or a gospel tract or some little book study or guide. booklet, study guide, and it will be stating some elements of their faith. And you can, of course, get entire books that summarize New Testament doctrine uh, the teachings of the New Testament church or whatever. Now, this is nothing more than a confession or a statement of faith on the level that is representative of those who are publishing or selling it or using it. Now, uh, but when you come into other denominational groups, you might have something like the, the Methodist Articles of Faith, Articles of Religion. I think they have the Church of England, 39 Articles of Religion. And then in the uh, Lutheran Church, you will have the Lutheran uh, Catechism and uh, the Lutheran, uh, uh, what is it, the Augsburg. word, I'm, the Augsburg Confession. And uh, then uh, the uh, Congregationalists have a statement of faith. And all and on you go, whatever group you want to mention, they will have their statements of faith. Now you have these people who are using sophistry and uh, pulling the wool over people's eyes, so to speak, putting smoke in their eyes, who come along and say, well, we don't believe in any creeds, we don't believe in any con confessions, we don't believe in man-made doctrines, we just follow the Bible. And uh, as I said before on this subject, what these people are actually saying is uh, what others have believed is of no consequence. Uh, that's not in the Bible. That's not true. That's just man-made stuff. And what I'm giving you is the pure, unadulterated Word of God. And you just take what I'm telling you and throw all these creeds and throw everything else out. They're just begging the question, 
asking you to accept their statement as the truth of the Bible and reject what historic Christianity has said about it. Now, unfortunately, this seems to be the strong suit of those who attack and reject the Trinity. They want to say, oh, this was something that was started by men. You don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. Blah, 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 blah. All these arguments that appeal to the simple-minded that are easily deceived, easily beguiled, easily tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The question is, is the essence of the doctrine of the Trinity there? Is God the Father God? Is God the Son God? Is God the Spirit God? Do we have any scripture that will authenticate that all three of these persons are indeed deity? And do they constitute one true God? When Jesus said, I and my Father are one, what was he talking about? Was he talking about one in essence of nature? Was he talking about one in their being, one in their deity? What was he talking about? Well, the Jews understood him to be asserting that he was equal with God because they took up stones to stone him. They said, uh, you're blaspheming. You're blaspheming because you've made yourself equal with God. Well, now the cults come along, the Christ deniers come along, the Arians come along, the Sabaeans come along, the Socinians come along, or whatever they're called, whatever flag they're flying. What do they do? They zero in on undermining the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what they did in the Bible. It's nothing new. We talk about, oh, we got new cults, we got new churches, we got new sects, we got new false. No, it's all there in the Bible. It's all there in the Bible. Undermining the Lord Jesus Christ, undermining the truth about God, it's right there in the Bible, and it, it, it's just like a performer. You know, uh, we had a comic that recently died. His name was Benny Hill, and of course a lot of his stuff was kind of risque comedy, and I'm not here, you know, to uh, sit in judgment about this particular thing, but I noticed in some of the reviews when he died, one of the points that was brought out on him that he had so many characters that he represented in his performance. No comic has represented more changes of faces and or characters than this particular fellow. Now you got one like Red Skelton and, and you've got different images. It's the same actor just putting on a different personality. Now that's what we have with these people when they start denying the truth about God in any generation. A new cult will come on the scene. We'll say, oh, have you, have you heard about this new doctrine? It's not new. It's just changed its costume. Mm -hmm. And so, Larry, when we go back in Christian history, kind of get back now to the thing you led me off to discuss here about the creeds, when we start quoting historic Christianity and we quote the creeds, the confessions, the statements of faith, and then these that you have on the chart here, the so-called fathers of the faith or the theologians that have written for the various denominations or Christian churches. We're not quoting these as authorities necessarily. Authorities in what sense uh, or what context we may be quoting them an authority in the context of theology or in the context of confessional Christianity. But we are not relying upon this for our authority. Our authority is whatever God has revealed to us. But what we are saying is these people understood it the same way we understand it. And if God's Spirit revealed it this way or led others this way to understand it in ages gone by, it gives us some confirmation that we're not out here flying around by ourselves in unnavigated air. We have had people out there before us. It's not unnavigated water that we're treading in here because we can look at these various quotations you have here from Lightfoot, the Apostolic Fathers, and you have here from Kelly, the Early Christian Doctrines, and uh, any number of the theological sources that we have available to us, Shaft's Creeds of Christendom as an example. 
and a book I have here lying on the uh, little platform, The History of Christian Doctrines by Burkhoff, for instance. We have history testifying to the validity of Trinitarianism, and we're not going to accept this system of the non-Trinitarians of just shoving this aside, saying this is of no consequence, this is not significant, this is just man-made stuff. We believe that the Christians down through the years and any given generation have had the blessing of the Holy Spirit upon them because God promised it. Mm -hmm. I'll be with you always. So God is communicating through His people exactly. down through time. Now, this doesn't make it valid. This doesn't validate it uh, as being divine revelation, but it does show us that historically God's Spirit has revealed the same thing to others and other generations that we believe today. Now, let those who contend for some novel concept about Christ or God, let them bring forth their witnesses. Let them bring forth their demonstrations from ages gone by. Who believed your doctrine? Who were your advocates? Who were your friends? Who are your fathers in days gone by? Now, we're quoting them to show that we have an alliance with them back to the Bible, and it's a continuity. Yes. Now, let me, with that point brought up, let me get Mark in here since the show's over half over, and I think all you've said is Augsburg or something. <laughs> a few other things. Uh, you, you said that very well, brother. Uh, uh, Bob's excellent uh, introduction there, uh, and I'm going to tie these charts in that, that Bob was just referring to, uh, talking about that continuity going back in time, who were the fathers, stuff like this. Uh, I know from your background with the uh, United Pentecostal Church, basically a Sabellian type uh, organization of the oneness of God denying the Trinity. Uh, you've heard this argument about uh, the Trinitarian doctrine came up in 325 uh, A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. Now, just briefly tell me a little, little bit from your own personal knowledge, is that argument valid? And then from that I'm going to tie these charts okay. into that and we'll see what we come up with. Well, like you say, the uh, that type of an argument is very common, not only with uh, Sabellian people, but with all those who deny the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, you can see it in the Jehovah's Witnesses material. I noticed you had one of their little booklets uh, on the doctrine of the Trinity. Yes. Uh, which was real popular some time ago. And uh, Robert Bowman, by the way, wrote a book, excellent book, refuting that uh, booklet. Yeah, maybe you don't want to hold it up to the camera here. Uh, That's, uh, I think they've printed uh, over 100 million of those already. Yeah, they were handing that out. And, and what it has done, the point I want to make from this, is that the, uh, uh, this book is built upon false, out-of-context quotations uh, from uh, mm -hmm. uh, all of these different sources. And uh, another man, by the way, that I'm currently, uh, I guess, somewhat in a controversy with, a oneness minister, uh, he does the same thing. He's compiled a number of quotes from... Uh, uh, standard sources, theological dictionaries, uh, commentaries, uh, religious encyclopedias, and various things. He's compiled various quotes which state that the doctrine of the Trinity developed uh, throughout the first several centuries and was not fully developed until fourth century or whatever they uh, wish to say. But uh, the argument is invalid for this reason because they do not understand what these works mean by developed. By developed or formulated, they're not saying that the doctrine was not there before. Mm -hmm. It's almost like in our Christian experience. Uh, you know, we come to know the Lord at a certain time, and then we develop and grow and mature in our faith as time goes on. We come into a more clear awareness of what it is that we believe as time goes on. The same thing with the early church. As time went on, as their doctrine was attacked, and, and that's really the important point, it was the attack on their doctrine that brought about the, uh, the statement of their faith. I'm, I'm trying to recall a particular church father that I was reading after. It may have been the documents from the Council of Nicaea or one of the early councils that the church called, and they called them specifically to respond to heresy. And when they wrote up their response to it, they would say something to the effect that uh, this is the holy apostolic faith passed to us from the apostles. And then they would go on to state their doctrine that they believe. 
So it was their conviction that what they were stating was entirely in accord with and harmonious with the faith of the apostles and that they are upholding right now. So to say that the doctrine of the Trinity developed is not to say that it wasn't there before. It's simply to say that it responded to the attacks on itself and, uh, and then it uh, formulated in that respect. But the argument is invalid, and it's invalid for the reason that you'll show here that there are various ones. One that comes to mind is Tertullian, who wrote against Praxius. And Praxius was a man who taught a doctrine very similar to oneness, and uh, Tertullian wrote a, a work against him called Against Praxis, and in it he affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity. And Tertullian lived in the 200s, well over a hundred years before Nicaea. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's yeah, just that's coming up in the charts for, for okay. sure. You're so you've got some quotes here. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I want to get to those, but it looks like Bob, he's just dying to say something. I had, a, I had a, I had a bright, <laughs> bright idea uh, pop in my mind as a result of looking at this. Did you say this Jehovah's Witness book? Yeah, that's a Jehovah's Witness well, book. Well, I, I, un unfortunately, I have not had the advantage of this before. But I was just noticing here, and this is one of the fallacious arguments offered sometimes against the Trinity. They dig back into paganism or Babylon or somewhere in the deep, deep, dark past, and they dig out these tales about what the pagans believed about three gods, and here we've got a man, for instance, with three faces. And I remember David Bernard, he had, uh, what was it, uh, something with three heads on it, a Greek god with three heads on it. And uh, they try to say, well, all this back here shows that you got your doctrine from the pagans, the doctrine of the Trinity from the pagans, because you've got these three ideas uh, floating around back in the, the mythology and the paganism of the past, and uh, so therefore the doctrine of the Trinity came out of paganism. Now, Larry, I debated an atheist one time, and he used the same argument to prove that we got the doctrine of God from paganism, mm -hmm. because, because he dug back into the past, and he said all of these pagan religions had an idea that there was a God. So uh, if you're going to use that kind of a logic against the Trinity, then the atheist is going to have you cornered in disproving the very existence of God because he's going to say, you got your argument that there's a God from them. But the, the answer to all this kind of stuff is really in the first and second chapter of Romans. Men have had a revelation of God in nature, according to the first chapter of Romans. Uh, God has revealed it unto them, even the unseen things of God, even His eternal power and Godhead. But men have turned from the knowledge of this. They have turned to their own imagination in, in trying to imagine what this God is like, and then they create these things here according to the image of man. And uh, God never authorized any of this to be done. But you see, the first chapter of Romans shows you that men have a knowledge of God revealed to them in nature, the creation. And I'll not take time to read it, but the whole chapter, the first chapter of Romans, tells you how God has revealed this. But men turn to their vain imagination, and then they begin to create these idolatrous expressions of God. But... Here's the point. Where did they get the idea that there was three? I mean, where did they come up with that? Where did they get that idea? Where does this three idea come up with? This three in one idea. Where did it come from? Now, these people here, they saying, oh, you got that from the pagans. Where did the pagans get it? To distort it. Now, this is a distorted form of it. But Larry, somewhere back there, this idea that there's three and yet one got into the minds of people. Now, where does it come from? The truth of it in its pure, unadulterated form is right here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons, yet one God. This is a perversion of it. Mm -hmm. This is a perversion of it. We don't follow any one of these expressions of the doctrine of the Trinity that they have illustrated here. Not a single one of them is valid. But they they do have an element here that we wonder about now. Where did the three-in-one concept come from? 
in debating an atheist that I mentioned before one time, I said, where did the idea of God come from? He said, oh, an old priest told a little boy one time, the little boy said, uh, who made all these stars and the sun and the moon? And the old priest, he deceived the little boy, and he, he invented the idea that there was a God. I said, uh, what's that old priest's name and address? I want to talk to him because I want to know where he got that idea. Who gave him that idea? You see, the origin of ideas is very important when we consider things like this because they're offering this as proof that we got the doctrine of the Trinity from paganism. Where did paganism get the idea of three and one? Well, it's interesting, too, that if you check, uh, you know, archaeological finds and things of the different pagan religions and cultures going back in time, you find out that there's a concept of a great flood in all these pagan cultures and religions. And a concept of atonement. Yes, and resurrection. And a concept of a virgin and a son. Exactly. And uh, so, obviously, there must have been something back there that they were perverting off of. Right. <laughs> well, it, seems, it seems to me that uh, usually... Uh, almost everyone who evaluates this material, except for those that believe the Bible to be the Word of God, they look at it in the opposite way that we would. They evaluate Christianity in the light of all these other things. And so they say Christianity is just one of many of these instead of looking at it the way we do, that these are perversions of the true that we have in the Scripture. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say another thing. Because this argument is constantly used about pagan trinities and things, uh, uh, there's a lot of reference made to the Hindu trinity of uh, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and whoever else is in that one. And, uh, uh, and Krishna, maybe. Yeah, uh, some, someone's in that. But uh, uh, the point that I wanted to make is that actually these religions, that most of these Eastern religions, are actually pantheistic. Mm -hmm. And to them, everything is God. And so whatever is, is simply a manifestation of that one everything. So there's actually everything is one. God is everything, and everything is God. And so all these things are just manifestations of that, and that actually corresponds more closely to the oneness doctrine mm -hmm. than it does to Trinitarianism. So, Mary, I was referring uh, to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, that God has revealed it unto them or showed it unto them, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they were without excuse. But then in verse 25, it says, they changed the truth of God into a lie. Now, if indeed these things here reflect something about the Trinity, they are reflecting it according to Romans 1.25, change the truth of God into a lie. In other words, what they saw was a concept of three in one, but it says they became vain in their imaginations, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And so this doesn't express the doctrine of the Trinity in its truthfulness. This expresses the doctrine of the Trinity in its truthfulness. Well, it seems like it, that whole argument is kind of based on a logical fallacy anyway uh, about saying that we got the Trinity from these pagan religions. It sounds like a post hoc fallacy, at, you know, after the fact, because of the fact something like this, it just doesn't jive that just because something is out there that we, ne it doesn't necessarily follow that we picked it up from them, although it's interesting, everything we've talked about, which certainly taken it, it can be taken into account, but simply because something existed back there, uh, I can think of a pagan god, Tammuz, which, uh, yeah. you know, he was a hunter and then he died and 40 days later he resurrected. And even uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, let's say, who put that book out, wouldn't argue that they believe in the, tr the resurrection based on Tammuz, you know, uh, you know Larry, it, it gets it, into these, these logical fallacies. It, it's also the based on the presumed ignorance of the person who's going to read this, mm -hmm. that he is ignorant enough and stupid enough that he, that he will read this and draw that same conclusion that this writer is drawing through the illogical well, I noticed, yes. I noticed in that book that they couldn't even spell Nicaea correctly. When we were talking about the Council of Nicaea from 325, I think they spelled it N-I-C-A-E-A -E or something like that. It was kind of interesting on whatever page that, that showed up on it. Now, with that, with time running out, I want to jump into these charts and uh, just let people know uh, a lot of times the argument always comes up that uh, Nicaea started it all. And that's really not the case. It's, uh, basically, it comes right, goes back right to the first century, right out of the scriptures themselves, 
as Mark has talked about in the first show in this series. I would just like to bring out some other facts and evidences and uh, let you all consider this. And I'll move briefly through these because uh, the time is limited. Uh, basically, on our chart here, we have the doctrine of the Trinity and the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Those are the people before the Council of Nicaea. So when these, these cultists basically argue that it came from Nicaea, hopefully these references here will show that uh, their argument is uh, it just doesn't hold water. Uh, point number one, uh, we find that outside of uh, the New Testament, the chief first century Trinitarian reference appears in... Uh, uh, Didache. Is that? Didache. Didache. Uh, I'm not too good on pronouncing some of these, these words, but it's around A.D. 35 through 60 uh, in a reference to baptism. And then, of course, what it says here, but concerning baptism, thus shall ye baptize, having first recited all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living or running water. But if thou hast neither, then pour water on the head thrice in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Of course, uh, Bob referenced to it earlier. That's from J.B. Lightfoot's uh, edition of the Apostolic Fathers, 1976, page 126. And uh, so you've got the New Testament and uh, that particular reference. There are some others, but these are that's pretty. That, that's one of the strongest. There, we go into the second century. We find uh, a quotation that's uh, in the original parchment and stuff. Uh, the doctrine of one God, the Father and Creator. God made himself known in the person of Jesus and that he had poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church. That's from uh, Kelly's Early Christian Doctrines, page 87. And in there he gives the references where this early second century writing is found. Uh, and then moving on quickly, uh, continuing through the Antinacian Fathers, uh, we come to Ignatius in A.D. 110 through 120 writing this. Uh, he states, we, all, we have also as a physician the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ, the only begotten Son and Word, before time began, but who afterwards became also man of Mary the Virgin. For the Word was made flesh, being incorporeal, he was in the body, being impassable, he was in a passable body, being immortal, he was in a mortal body, being life, he became subject to corruption, corruption that he might free our souls from death and corruption and heal them and might restore them to health when they were diseased with ungodliness and wicked lusts. Uh, and I mentioned this one here. Basically, that comes from Alexander Roberts and uh, James Donaldson's edition of the Antinocene Fathers, uh, volume 1, page 52. But basically, this shows you right here, going way back, Ignatius teaching that Jesus is the Lord our God before time began. And he made this, his sacrifice that he might free our souls. But it goes back to what Bob was stating so clearly earlier that the, that the doctrine that Jesus is God in the flesh must be adhered to. And when the minute you give that point that Jesus is God in the flesh and you, you know you're going to have to deal with God the Father, which almost everybody accepts as being God, suddenly you're, you're going to have to do one of three things, go with the Arians, go with the Sabellians, or go with the uh, Trinitarian concept, which I think is obviously the biblical doctrine. But we find going way back to that uh, second century statement by Ignatius, we find that Jesus is uh, the Lord and God. We go to Justin Martyr, who is uh, almost a contemporary with uh, Ignatius. He states, For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. And uh, your references are here. Also coming from the Antinocene Fathers, Volume 1, page 183, we've got a Trinitarian concept being taught by uh, uh, Justin Martyr. You go to Irenaeus, uh, the dates given here, who was a contemporary of Justin, and who was also a disciple of Polycarp, who in turn was a disciple of uh, the Apostle John. He states, uh, of course, this may be a little small for our readers, uh, for our people to keep up with on the uh, screen, but anyway, I'll just read it through. This, then, is the order of the rule of our faith. God the Father, not made, not material, invisible, one God, the creator of all things, this is the first point of our faith. So the first point of our faith, then, is God the Father. He goes on. The second point is this. The Word of God, Son of God, Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus our Lord, who was manifested to the prophets according to the form of their prophesying and according to the method of the Father's dispensation, through whom, i.e., the world, all things were made 
who also at the end of the age to complete and gather up all things was made man among men visible and tangible in order to abolish death and show forth life and produce perfect reconciliation between God and man and the third point is so now we've got the first point God the Father the second point Jesus Christ Jesus the Son of God third point is the Holy Spirit through whom personal pronoun uh, the prophets prophesied and the fathers learned the things of God who at the end of the age was poured out in a new way upon mankind and all the earth, renewing the uh, man to God. That's from Kelly's Early Christian Doctrines, page 89. And, of course, you have your reference here, Against Heresies, written by Irenaeus. Now, I think those, uh, as we move on, and you all were talking earlier about how things were developing, Mark, I know you were getting into that. Uh, we're seeing this doctrine uh, coming out. You'd mentioned earlier Tertullian. Here we find him in the 3rd century, almost right at the beginning of it. Uh, 145 A.D., 220 A.D., uh, thus connection of the Father and the Son and of the Son and the Paraclete produces three coherent persons who are yet distinct one from another. These three are one essence, not one person. As it is said, I and my Father are one, Bob was quoting that earlier, in respect of unity of substance, not singul singularity of number. Okay, and that's against uh, the praxis as you were uh, mentioning a while ago. And, of course, as we could go on through here, Cyprian of Car Carthage, uh, A.D. 2 250, your references are given here, uh, Novatian of uh, Rome, uh, his treatise concerning the Trinity, Gregory, uh, however you pronounce that, <laughs> of uh, uh, Neo Caesarea, A.D. Uh, 270, and Lucian of Antioch, three, 300 A.D., and uh, your references, and then there's plenty more as we go back in time before Nicaea. Uh, I wanted to just get this on tape and let it be known that the, the evidence is there. There's plenty of it. The problem with most people is they don't bother to check it out. Uh, with that, I'm going to move on to the last part of what I have here. Oh, I guess I, I did these in, in reverse order, but I won't read them all now because uh, with a few minutes left, I want to get Bob and Mark back involved in this. There's some, there's some other uh, early Anti-Nicene fathers I could bring up. Uh, Athenagoras uh, from around 170 A.D. to 180, and then, of course, down here, uh, Theophilus, uh, uh, 116 to 181. That's about the time he lived. Uh, talking about things like, um, in like manner also the three days which were before the luminaries are types of the Trinity, of God, of His Word, and His wisdom. Uh, references are all here. There's plenty of them going right back down through time, long before the Council of Nicaea ever convened. In fact, the Council of Nicaea used this material as a basis for further adding to their doctrine that they formulated in 325. Uh, Mark, would, uh, would you like to state anything else on, uh, along these lines? Uh, well, I just, as you went through these, <clears throat> in several of them, you see this uh, threefold structure working its way out. Like in one, it said, the first point of our faith is this. The second point of our faith is this. And you kind of see that in the early Apostles' Creed as well. It's based upon this threefold revelation of God. We believe in God the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. So it has this, this threefold awareness of the church. The church, as you can see in these quotes and also in its early creeds and things, it, it believed and was convinced that, this, that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in these three parts of God's revelation were locked up everything that the Christian faith speaks of. And I think that's what we started this particular show with, was pointing out that uh, we believe that all of the Christian faith flows from these points, and that's what gives it u its uniqueness, its, uh, its beauty, and its truth. And I think the church fathers and our discussion of creeds and things has only confirmed that this was the conviction of the church from the very start. And uh, it is aberrant, and it, is, uh, it flies in the face of the scriptural revelation to deny that. Now, let me ask you this, since you have the background in, from a group that denies the Trinity and was basically in the uh, Sabellianistic uh, modalism idea. Now, they come up with this idea that uh, Jesus is the Father, and Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and he's just basically it's one person that's got three different, he's got three different masks on, and at one point he's, the Holy Spirit at one point, he's that. Uh, 
and they use this as a way to get out of a lot of these what to us is Trinitarian verses in the Bible that uh, that show this clear distinction between persons, but they kind of try to, to merge that. Now, uh, what a, if you use that line of reasoning? If you use that line of reasoning that it really the Father is Jesus, He's just got a different mode or He's putting on a different mask. What's to prevent them from saying, well, you really don't have a Trinity, or, or, or you know, why why do they restrict themselves to those three modes? Why don't they say, well, God uh, presented himself in the mode of the burning bush. They do. Okay, so so they are logically consistent on this point. The word three, the number three, has no for the consistent one, and I refer to David Bernard because he's the one that's written anything of real significance from their perspective. And uh, uh, in there he says in his Oneness of God book, he specifically says that the number three has no uniqueness or special uh, nature with regard to the nature of God. So to him, uh, you know, for us, we see all over the Scripture, there's a clear uh, threeness there. Mm -hmm. You have the Father sending the Son, and you never find these type of descriptions with regard to God sending the Son or the Holy Spirit, the Father sending the Son, the Holy Spirit, and this type of thing. You don't have any more added to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have another over here, a fourth, that is described in this type of relationship. Well, why doesn't he say uh, the Father sending the burning bush? Or well, <laughs> the, uh, these theophanies is basically yeah, what I'm talking about. Yeah, it seems like they don't another another one of God's many manifestations. But you don't seem to get that personal interaction with these other manifestations. Right, that's exactly right. Yeah. As you get with the Father, Son, and Holy whether, Spirit. Whether whether the word three appears in Scripture or not is really irrelevant because there is clearly only three who are called God that are described having these relationships between each other, and no more are included in that. Mm -hmm. So it does take on special meaning and significance for us. Right. That, that is true. Definitely wanted to go over that point because it seemed like a, an interesting one to That's me. That's certainly and true. With your, with your background in it, you know, you were the man to ask to see how, you know, what, what went through yeah, the thinking process. Well, we're running ba rapidly out of time, gentlemen. Uh, we basically have around a, a minute or so left. And I would like, as we did in the last show, to uh, give you gentlemen a chance to, uh, in, you know, in a brief statement, uh, say something to our viewers at home. Tell them your convictions and, and the importance of these things we've discussed today. And, uh, and of course, and I'll wrap it up after you all have your say. So, Bob, you want to lead off and just well, talk yes, to the viewers Well, yes, Larry. At home? One of the misrepresentations of our appeal to history, our appeal to these men that you mentioned and the sources that are available back uh, through history, one of the misrepresentations of that is that we are looking for authority, we are looking for uh, the statement of the doctrine, and finally when we run out of men and sources back there, uh, we have this one, this Pentecostal man, Mr. Bernard, for instance, who says, well, we may assume that the uh, writers of the New Testament were oneness, because uh, you can't have up to a certain point, you can't find a certain terminology or a certain statement of the doctrine in the form that it came to later. No, you cannot, uh, you cannot make those assumptions. What we're doing in referring back to these sources is giving the available evidence. Not everything that these men believe was written down and not everything that uh, they wrote down perhaps is even with us. But we can't go in making assumptions on the basis of a, of a 20th century theology that has developed in this age uh, in the past, uh, what, 100 years or so about the, the Trinity. And, uh, but we are appealing to these men that the elements of Trinitarian thought, as it accumulated to the point that we have it today, you have them back there mm -hmm. at that time. And that's mainly, we're not looking to this as authorities, but we're looking at these to the extent they confirm. All right. Now, Mark, just real briefly, it's time. Real brief, I agree. I agree. I think that's a good <laughs> summarization of uh, what we've covered in this lesson. Okay. Well, I want to thank Bob L. Ross and Mark McNeil for being here today. I'm Larry Wessels. I want to invite you to uh, call a number on your screen or... Uh, Wait for the ending credits and uh, write Pilgrim Publications for more information on this subject and others. 
think Bob has written uh, many articles con uh, dealing with the oneness Pentecostals, uh, David Bernard. And I have I 16 was, articles on that. 16 articles. These are available and many other materials. So just call the numbers on your screen. We'll continue this series in our next program. So stay tuned and be with us. God bless you. This is Larry Wessels for Pilgrim Publications. Please contact Christian Answers for free information on numerous subjects, important subjects, such as the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Free newsletters are available on the heretical position held by many unbiblical cults, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and the Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity. Free newsletters are available on strange groups, such as the King James Onlyites. To receive your free information, please call 512 218-8022 or email us at cdebater at aol.com To see full-length videos on these and other subjects, go to Yahoo Video, type Larry Wessels into the search box, and click on the icon for iShoot Video or iShoot Video 2.